Here's kind of the program for the next few weeks, all right? Thursday night, we'll have a regular prayer meeting service. Thursday night, 7 o'clock, like we normally do. And then, next Sunday, we'll have one service like this. We'll have a 10.30 service next Sunday. Then prayer meeting, the, you know, that week. The 7th of June, which is two weeks from today, we're going to go, we're not having church here. We're going out to Brother Thurman's campsite out there at South River. We're just going to have a church-wide barbecue, uh, singing, uh, dinner on the grounds, church service out there. We'll set up and we'll have, a, have church service preaching and singing and just enjoy that day, that afternoon together. And uh, we'll take a knee. You ladies, sisters, bring your dinner on the ground type stuff. And uh, we'll barbecue us some Boston butts and things like that, maybe some chicken, and just have a good day together. And uh, we wanted to do it before it was too hot. And so I think this would be a good time to do it. That will give us about three weeks before we can open this thing up all together. And uh, so we're, that's what we're looking towards, all right? So for the next two weeks, that's kind of the plan. And uh, uh, we're going to approach in that direction. The 14th of June, the 14th of June, uh, you know, some of the things that have happened have really turned out to be great blessings. Back here, back, back several months ago, uh, in fact, last year, Brother Dana Williams came through. Y'all remember Brother Dana came in one Sunday morning, and, and uh, he wasn't going to preach, but he came back that night and preached for us. We, I, I personally believe that in my own heart, I know there are others, I know there are others, but Dana Williams and Tom Hayes are what I call church evangelists. Church evangelists, they feed the flock of God. And I wanted to introduce him to our church for, for ever since I got here. He stays booked 50 and 55 meetings a year, and uh, he just stays booked constantly. And he told me, he said, Brother Rapp, said, he said, as soon as I get an opening, well, he's got a list that long for when he does get an opening. And he says, I'll do my best. And uh, this coronavirus shut his meetings down until the middle of June. And so I said, well, listen, you've got meetings all shut down. It may be God to give us the corolla just so you can get around here with us. <laughs> and so he's going to be with us the 14th of June. 14th, 15th, and 16th of June, we're going to have special services here, and Brother uh, Dana Williams and his wife will be with us during those few services, all right? Now, we're not having Sunday school, not for, not for a while. We're not going to be opening Sunday school up for uh, several few weeks now, several weeks. But remember, the 14th, we'll start with Brother Dana Williams, and uh, I believe that you will thoroughly enjoy his ministry. Uh, I, I get, I, I'm so thrilled about it, I don't want to do have him over here. And so I'm looking forward to his being with us. All right. I think that's most of the announcements that I'm supposed to make this morning. And I'm getting a nod from Sister Ann that I did real good. <laughs> so, so I know it must be a good situation. All right, now, limit your, limit your, your, your handshake, neck hugs, and talking about the family. And let's stand together. Sister, give us a good uh, giving song. We're going to bring our offerings. Bring your offering. And I don't know why in the world we don't pass them, but uh, let's bring it because you're going to talk to everybody anyhow and visit. <laughs> uh, but it's a good time to take your fellowship. Let's bring the offering to the Lord, all right? And then we'll pray. Give us a lick, too. Let's stand together. And you just go ahead and bring it. We'll pray.
partake and bless the offering. And uh, what a real blessing it is to be able to give by God for the privilege of worshiping by offering. We're grateful for that. Let me also say this. If, if you do have a little, uh, get a little curious about shaking hands and all, there's, there's germex and everything else scattered all over the place. So help yourself to it, all right? Let's ask the Lord to bless this offering. Brother Rob, I have a temporary old timers man right there. Did y'all see it? I felt it. I felt it. Like you're about to get all these in prayer. Lord, you promised there'd be nothing that we couldn't make it through. And in my heart, I know your word is true. It's just these waters that I'm sailing through right now are mighty rough. Could you wrap me in your arms and hold me? Trying hard to fly, but we can't find a 
that's transpired in my own heart my own life. And I think every saved person can testify that that's true. Amen. God has effected a change in you. And uh, I bless him for all that he's done. We have your Bibles in 3rd John. This is a uh, the shortest book of the Bible, shortest book of the New Testament. And uh, it is a tremendous book, not dealing with a number of doctrinal type things like other books do, but rather gives it to us a tremendous picture of Christian living amidst adverse circumstances. This is at the close of the first century, somewhere around 90, 95 AD, the aged apostle John has took pen in hand to write and to advise and express thanksgiving for a brother by the name of Annas or Gainus. And uh, it's a tremendous little book. The two things that are so prominent about it is, of course, the hospitality that was extended to uh, the brethren in the early church era. And then also the domineering of church officials who was going to infiltrate the church. Now, whether you realize it or not, the church is a body, a blessed body. We do not all have the same function, but we do have the same head. Amen. And that is our blessed Lord Jesus. Amen. And so, operating in the capacity where God has put us is a wonderful, blessed thing in the church unity. And so, uh, this is a, a, a great book. And I want to speak for a little while, say a few words about Brother Gainus. And ask the Lord to take and help us as we try to speak. Look at verse number one. The elder, under the well-beloved Gainus, whom I love in the truth. Now that phrase, the truth, is in both 2 John and 1 John, a very preeminent uh, phrase. He's dealing with the authority of the Word of God. And uh, in days of declension, in days of dark days, it's the Word of God that is our source and our substance for help and for comfort. And so I love him in the truth. He's a much beloved believer. It's possible that uh, he's the same person over there in the book of Romans in chapter 16 who was given the hospitality for the Apostle Paul, his host. Again, over there in Acts chapter 20, there in verse number 4, he's mentioned uh, Gainus. Uh, if, the, if the scripture unfolds itself in this manner, Robert Lee said that uh, Gainus was converted by the preaching of the Apostle John he was baptized by the Apostle Paul. You remember over in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said that he baptized none but the household of Crispus and of Gaius. And then again, he's ministered here in Corinth and has ministered to numbers of missionaries and itinerant preachers and those that would propagate the gospel. He says, uh, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospered. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. I read that verse and I think of the Apostle John as he's rejoicing to hear of the truth 
that is being walked in by Gainus. You know, it's a good to have the truth, uh, but it's probably better that the truth has you. Amen. You know, the idea that we should hold forth the truth is a very real, real admonition, and thank God for it. Uh, but I want to say to you, it, it, it's that the truth ought to be allowed to hold us. Y'all understand what I'm saying? We uh, certainly, it's true of Gaius and it ought to be true of us. Uh, men would rather see a sermon than they had hear a sermon. I don't need no amens on that part right now. But that's the truth. You'd much rather see somebody walking the walk than just hear them talking and it be hallow words. Nothing counts more for God in a day of facts and information than the testimony of a holy life before them. John said he rejoiced greatly in what he saw and what he heard about Gaius. Verse number four, he said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children Walk in truth. I was thinking about the joy that we have as Christians. Uh, we rejoice when we see somebody get saved. Uh, my heart thrills and blessed and I'm encouraged when I see somebody genuinely uh, get converted. I, I bless the Lord for that and you do also. But then how my heart aches and how it hurts when I see those that have made a profession in Christ return to the former life that they used to have. Isn't that a great heartbreak to all of us? Yes, sir. We oftentimes scratch our head and say, how in the world could that happen? What a terrible heartache that is. The sow returning to her wallowing in the mire or the dog returning to its vomit is the way the apostle said it. But on the other hand, when truth has been received and when a confession has been made and there is a continual walk in that truth, doesn't it thrill our hearts to see somebody whose life has been changed by the gospel and they're still going on with the Lord. Yeah, yeah, Boy, man. that just stirs yes, me. And I bless the Lord for it. John says that he has no greater joy than to see that kind of episode and testimony in the life of Gainus. I uh, notice this in verse number five. Uh, Beloved, uh, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and the strangers. Uh, it seemed like John took a special delight in Gainus because of his hospitality. Uh, he was, of course, Paul's host on one occasion and, and evidently the host of many more and of John's host on several occasions. And uh, this hospitality, his graciousness, even the strangers, uh, those that were Jew, not only Jews, but those that were Gentiles who come under the gospel. Now Jesus said that if you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And of course he said if you fail to do it unto the least of these, uh, then you also failed me. Over in Matthew chapter number 25. And then I, I recall where the apostles said that some have entertained angels unaware. Here, Gainus is commended for his faithful hospitality to even strangers coming through. And in that hour and in that day, uh, that's the only way that they didn't have motels like we do and holiday inns like we do and all of those things. They they moved in with church members and they took them home and they spent the night with them and they took care of them. And Gainus did this. Of course, in verse number six, he says, 
uh, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. He says, you've not only taken them in and took care of them, he said, but I want you to understand there's a lot of rewards wrapped up in the way that you're living your life. He talks about the fact that in his kindness, the church has become aware of how kind this man Gainus was. It says, the born witness in, of your charity before the church. He said, and, and then also Gainus, his name is enshrined in the word of God. We're reading about him today. All that he did in his, in his everyday Christian life. We're reading about that. What a reward that is for your name to be in this place instead of some other places. Can I have an amen right there? And then that's it all. Uh, but you know, he talks about going, bringing them forward on their journey. Uh, those men who carried the gospel in that hour, Oftentimes, there would be perhaps an unbeliever that would want to give to them or help support them. But those men wouldn't take uh, what the unbelievers or non-believers offered. They did it for two reasons. One, they did it because it might imply that their master was too poor to take care of them. They had boasted how that the Lord would take care of them. And how God had promised to be their sufficiency. They wouldn't take the, the givings of the non-believer. In fact, not only would it might imply that the master would not be able to take care of them, but also hidden in the midst of that was the idea that folks could take and give their way into the grace of God. And these early evangelists, they wouldn't have any of that sort. And so they were absolutely dependent upon the people of God. They made their request known unto the Lord, and the church responded. Gainus was one who had his ears open to hear what he might be able to do to help them on in their journey in carrying forth the truth. Verse number 7 because for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. That word to receive right there, it means to be receiving the workers of the truth and the carriers of the truth. It means to do everything possible to help them. And that's what Gainus was guilty of. He was guilty of helping them in every way that he was able to. And so John commends Brother Gainus. Now I'd like to go back to verse number two. Verse number two says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul is in health. I want to borrow a praise from over in the Old Testament. Over in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 20 and verse number 9, just before Joab killed Ammon, he called out to him, he said, Art thou in health, my brother? I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of spiritual health. Spiritual health. He says, how is your soul this morning? Spiritual health. Now, in John the Apostle's life, between the gospel and this writing of this epistle, there has been a marvelous change in his life. You remember when he was walking with the Lord and they found somebody out there that didn't just quite agree with the Lord. And uh, John said, now, uh, now, Lord, these guys, uh, they're, not, they're not of us. You reckon we ought to call down some lightning and thunder upon them? John was a little bit quick at times to do such. Uh, he's not calling down lightning and thunder now. 
Somehow there's been a change, a transformation. He's full of love at this point. Boy, God has so done something in him to change both his attitude and his direction and the way that he talked and the way that he thought. Now he's the apostle of love. I was thinking as I read this letter, you know, a man's private letters reveal an awful lot about him. You know, you can read public statements and perhaps glean things from a person, but if you really want to see something on the inside, you read some of his private letters. His journal. We, uh, our children have started keeping a daily journal. They write two or three little sentences at the end of the day in their little journal. And I've noticed how possessive they've got of that journal. They don't want nobody to see it. You know. I say you certainly get a, a vision of how a uh, person really is when you start reading his private letters. So it is here, this letter reveals the secrets of the heart of John. Uh, John wishes that Gainus may prosper in health as his soul has prospered. Now, we're coming out of the pandemic crisis of this Corolla thing. Corona thing. What's it? Corona. Corona. COVID-19 thing. And everybody's had help on their mind for the last two months. And boy, we've done everything from lock up each other and, and quarantine and mask each other and, and wash and all those wonderful things. And this morning we're even six foot apart, you know, except for families. Now I'm all for I'm all for healthiness. I really am. Sometimes we may go to an extreme that, that you know, way on out here. You'll hang out there for a while, but you'll be back. So, but now we ought to be safe about everything. I'm not saying anything against that. But we've been in, we've been involved in the health business for several months. All of us have. We're kind of enjoying just a little bit of uh, uh, getting out, and I thank the Lord for it. But I'll tell you the truth. Your health and my health, that's an invaluable commodity. Sure. If you've got good health, you ought to thank God for it. Yeah. You talk about a mercy of God. If you've got health this morning, you ought to be grateful. Yeah. Isn't that true? Yes. I, I, I do bless the Lord and I thank the Lord. Now, when I was a young man, I had pretty good health. I could go anywhere and do anything I wanted to, as strong as I could be, and, and carry on. But I've noticed it's not quite the same as it was. I don't know if years draw that out of you, or experience or exposure. Whatever it was, our health is important. We need to mark that down. And uh, you really never value your health until you lose it. You just get laid up for a little while and see how it is. You get to the point where you can't produce like you used to, can't function like you used to. And uh, your health is an important matter. Now, how about the soul? The soul's prosperity is important also. In fact, John puts these two right side by side in order for us to see it. He says, I'm praying, I'm wishing above all things that thou mayest prosper in health, even as thy soul prosper. It's foolish, but that's the way we think. It's foolish for us sometimes to Repair the house and not pay any attention to the tenant. The soul is the real you. The house is this body. And we'll fix this house up and we'll make up this house and we'll doctor this house and keep this house in shape and neglect our soul. 
Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah. And we all, it ought to be the other way around. But you know how we are. Uh, we are so upside down in this world. And I think it. And so, I want to speak to you about this for a little while. The soul health. I'm so glad we start services early, aren't you? So yeah, give me an amen yeah. right there. Now, that's a weak amen, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. But I got to think about this matter of our health and the soul's health. Let me look at verse number two and just examine those words for just a moment. Verse number two, the apostle said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Apparently, Brother Gainus was not well in body. At least he was not well all the time in body. John wishes that he had health that was uh, being the same measure as his soul was in health. The physical corresponding to the spiritual. Now he opens up by saying, I wish. You know what a wish is, don't you? A wish for a person who is saved is just a sanctified prayer. We take our wants and desires unto the Lord. The difference between the wish of the world and the wish of a child of God is that we have somebody that hears our prayers. Isn't that true? We're not feebly wishing upon the wind. We're carrying our burdens to the Lord. And so he says, I, I wish, I, I pray. In fact, some of the translations is that, that I pray that, that your soul, that your physical body may prosper. I think sometimes we as people of God ought to turn our wishes into prayers and let them be known. And so he said, I, I wish that thou mayest prosper. I was thinking about this, thou mayest prosper. And of course, this is the prayer that John was offering for Gainus. Uh, Gainus had served God and had taken and given to the Lord all of his substance and, and all of the hospitality and faithfully done so. And you know, it's not hard to wish a blessing on somebody that lives like that. Is it? Somebody that you know won't swander it away on the things of the world and the frivolous trinkets that come in and go. I'm saying to you, he says, that thou mayest prosper in all things. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that amazes, amazes me is that uh, folks think there's a, there's a certain advantage of being poor. Well, there's no spiritual advantage of being poor, not when you're full of pride. You know, one thing's as bad as the other. And if you're rich and you have something, you can be, be proud of it. But then that's pride also. So... We ought to just be content with the things that God allows us to have and dedicate it all to Him and use it to His glory. So gain us with that individual. It says that thou mayest prosper. He's not so much talking here about uh, material wealth. I think he's talking about his health, his spiritual vigor right here. That thou mayest prosper uh, in your physical like you've been prospering in your spiritual now, with that having been said, let me say that, you know, uh, some of God's people are all the time sick. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're going to be well. Now, there's a group of faith healers and things like that that they propagate and teach, you know, that uh, you're going to, your, 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 your sickness is a, the result of, of your sin. And, of course, there can be that truth. That, that can be true, but that's not altogether true. Mm -hmm. Then they say, if you're, if, you're, if you're constantly sick, God had not healed you, then you've got unconfessed sin in your life. Now, that's just not all. That's not, Gaius would have been a terrible example right there, wouldn't he? Because he is sick in body, but he was strong in spirit. So I have to take issue with that crap. Uh, it doesn't seem to me like they're able to hold up under this idea of sickness being all of, all of the uh, judgment and things of that nature. And so he, he talks to them about his health. 
Some of Christ's dearest uh, ones were sickly, uh, much so. It says, Lazarus, him whom thou lovest is sick. You know. So being a Christian doesn't exempt you from being sick or sickly. Ephraditus over there in the book of Philemon or in the book of, uh, of, of Philippians had hazarded his life and was sick even unto death. And Tremithus uh, uh, over there in the book of 2 Timothy, he was left sick at Miletum. So God's people get sick. And it's not because of necessarily unconfessed sin in their life. It may be that God's going to open up a new ministry in their life. So, so they get sick. He said, I wish that thou mayest prosper and be in hell, even as thy soul prosper. Spiritual, spiritual health is made the standard right here. Your physical health is secondary. Your spiritual health is primary, even as thy soul uh, is uh, uh, prosperous. I was, thinking, I was thinking along those lines and I got to thinking about this. How would it be? Would you want your physical condition to correspond with your spiritual condition? Would you want your physical condition to reflect your spiritual condition this morning? Uh, is it not true that we oftentimes take better care of the outward man rather than the spiritual man? Mm -hmm. I think it would be true of all of us. And so uh, the apostle here has placed these two together and together he has said that it's my desire because of your Christian experience and the spiritual vitality of your life I wish to goodness that your physical body was as in good a shape as your spiritual body. Well, what a Christian. What a desire. Now, let me for a moment mention some of the symptoms of ill health. How do you know you're sick? You know, that's what I'm talking about, spiritual health. How do you know you're sick? Well, I had a doctor's appointment this last week, and I had a, one of those, I think they call them virtual appointments now. <laughs> Since all this stuff has started, and you don't go face to face, you know, not unless you're just dying. And so they call you on the phone. And so 9 o'clock on Thursday morning, I believe it was, they called me, the nurse called first, and she said, Mr. Cole, let me ask you these questions. And she went to the there. I got them down to those questions, you know. And uh, I answered just, you know, like I knew what I was talking about. Then she asked me about my medicine. And I said, hold it just a minute. Honey! And I called Sister Ed in there. And she gave the list of medicines right on down. You know, got everything squared out. She said, well, the doctor's going to call you in a few minutes. So I sat there anxiously waiting for the doctor to call. And he did call. And I know what he did. He picked up all that the nurse had just said and all the little history and the last thing, you know. And he just went over it and he called me and he was checking me out over the phone. The nurse asked me, he said, Well, how, what was your blood pressure this morning? And I felt it. I said, I guess it's pretty good. <laughs> and so, but I knew they couldn't see me. We wasn't Skyping. Isn't that what they call that? Skyping? We wasn't doing that. We were just talking. And uh, so, so I've had one in virtual meetings. Now, there are some things that are just obvious when you're sick. Yeah. First of all, you have an abnormal temperature. I went in the hospital the other day uh, for just a few minutes with Sister Debbie. And when I went through there, of course, they asked me all the questions to begin with. And then as I went through, they shot me in the head with one of those uh, thermometers. And I looked at the woman and she smiled, and I smiled. She said, you're all right, go ahead. I said, well, how about that? <laughs> I went on in there and did whatever I was going to do. Uh, but you add an oil temperature. I mean, irregular sometimes, but abnormal all the time. If you're sick, you've got an abnormal temperature. Either it's too low or it's too high. 
We often think of too high is a fever, you know. But your temperature can go too low. Now, I know that there are some whose spiritual temperature is awful low. You would call it lukewarm in the Bible. And uh, there are some whose hearts have become lukewarm toward the Lord. And brother, one of the terrible tragedies is how much of life you miss if you just serve God with a lukewarm heart. Not hot, not cold, just lukewarm. Not in, not out, not up, not down. And the consequences of it is terrible for the Lord would spew you out of his mouth. Temperature, that's one of the signs of ill health. And of course, if it goes too high, there are some folks who have gotten such a... You know what happens when your temperature goes too high? Really, what you've got is an infection. An infection. And there are some folks that are, have got so much of an infection in their body, they need some antibodies in order to drop that down. On a man of box. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that? I've got to be a nurse right here on the front row to kind of give me a nod if I'm right or wrong. But if it's too high, you've got an infection going on somewhere. And everything's not managed out. Now there are some folks that all they want to do is just hip hip hoorah and run on this way and that way. And their emotional roller coasters up and down. Something's abnormal. Temperature. So you're not well. I'll tell you something else. He asked me, and of course, he was trying to trying to get my feelings about how 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 I felt. He says, Well, tell me about tell me about your heart. You know, I've had a little heart heart trouble. I, he says, he said, Do you have uh, any tightness in your chest? Do you do you feel do you feel bound in your chest? You know, is there any undue pressure? You know, you have a contracted heart. And uh, I said, no, I don't, I don't guess I do. I, I, sometimes I get a little tight when I'm doing all these chores that, you know, we've been doing since we've been locked up. And so I said, I said, what about, he said, do you have any tightness? I said, well, uh, the other day I had a little bit of, I had a little bit of tightness. I got out there and I chopped some wood and I did some other things. That night I was kind of bound up. And we've been painting around there and, and squatting down and everything, and I couldn't hardly move. <laughs> and uh, so I told him, I said, well, I guess I had a little bit of it. But you know, that, that idea of, of pressure around your heart and tightness of chest, you know, there are some folks that's got a tight, tight, pressured heart. That's why they're so intolerant. They, they'll cut off. You at the slightest indifference from them. What a sadness that is. Tightness of heart. Uh, we need, the Apostle Paul said, enlarged hearts. What we need. Hearts that will draw after God and draw after one another and minister to one another. Love not this world, but love the things of God. That's the kind of heart we need. It's, a, it's kind of a bad sign to have pressure around your heart. I was thinking about this. Now, this is my mama's deal, my grandma's deal. My brother's there, he'll testify. If you get sick around the Coleman place, the way they tell it is that you've fallen off your appetite. <laughs> that boy ain't doing good. He's, he's, not, he's not eating right. He's kind of falling off his appetite. Now, I want to say that's true spiritually. That's always a sign of disorder in the soul is when you fall off your spiritual appetite. Yeah. Yeah. Give that boy a biscuit. That boy needs some gravy. <laughs> Say amen right there. Amen. Put another piece of pot roast on that plate. That <laughs> boy needs to eat. You, just don't, you, have to, you have to feed that cold and that fever and get back well. So fall off your fail, fail, appetite is up. It's certainly a symptom of ill health. I'll tell you another one. Do you have any problem breathing? Breathing. Do you, are you any shortness of breath? 
Your doctor's asked you that several times. How about your breathing? Are you, are you breathing all right? They'll listen to you. In fact, they'll listen to your heart and put that thing on your back and thump you a few times sometimes. Breathe. Deep breath. Now, are you breathing all right? You know, in the, in the spiritual realm, prayer is the breath of the child of God. And when prayer becomes an unpleasant duty, instead of strengthening us, it weakens us. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you're in sad shape. Mm -hmm. Get to where you don't want to pray. Isn't that right? Y'all are with me now, aren't you? Yeah. You about finally got my analogy, haven't you? <laughs> Art thou in health, my brother? I wish that thou mayest prosper physically like your spiritual man is. I'll tell you another sign of unhealthiness or of ill health <coughs> is a general sluggishness. Oh, man, I suffer from this so terribly. Just generally sluggish. I mean, I get up sluggish sometimes. Are y'all like that? It's just me. I'm so worn out that when I get up, I, I just feel like going back to bed. The other night, I... I was so worn out I got up. I didn't sleep good the night before. Woke up about a quarter after two. And I said, well, I'm not going to get up at a quarter after two. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I laid there and just laid still, looked at the ceiling, and wondered if the daylight was ever come. So I finally got up at 4.30. Well, last night when I went to bed, buddy, I was tired. I went to bed and I laid down there. And I was ready to get up this morning. What time I got up? Generally sluggish, right, grouping down. It's what I used to call heart dropsy. You, know, you ever had that? Some of you have. Your heart just fell down and it just dropped down and just didn't have the heart to get back up. You know, heart dropsy. I've got plenty to do, but I. Just don't feel like that. Do you know spiritually your soul can get in the shape that it just does not want to serve God like it ought to be? Try to come into church becomes a drudgery to you. Praying becomes a drudgery to you. Bible reading becomes a drudgery to you. Preaching is a drudgery to you. That's something. General sluggishness. I'll tell you another one, and I'll, and I'll get off this little old thing, but you talk about uncontrolled cravings for unhealthy things. Mm -hmm. There are some things in moderation are very good for you. Little Debbie cakes. <laughs> A soda pop every now and then. Even a McDonald's hamburger once in a while. But I'll tell you, folks that live off that, you, we have become so accustomed to fast foods, drive throughs carry-outs, and pizza. Now some of y'all are going to go away saying, well, Brother Ralph's preaching against pizza. <laughs> what I'm preaching against is this. Some things in moderation are all right. They're not bad. But anything that is out of moderation is an imbalance and it threatens the soul. Yeah. You take this pleasure crazed world we're living in. A little bit of joy, a little bit of pleasure is fine. But when you get wrapped up in it and it becomes your God, yes, sir. brother, it's nothing but a casket. Yep. And on and on you can go. Unhealthy craving for the things of this world. Unhealthy things. Well, now I'm going to play the position, all right? Let me tell you about how to get healthy. Now, I know, I know that you know that I'm not a, I'm not a physician. But I'm going to play the position for a few moments. You know what I would diagnose to an unhealthy, soul, to an unhealthy condition of the soul? I diagnose, first of all, for you dear children of God, that you would seek good food. You start eating good food. 
Things that are healthy for you. Things that are right. I mean by that, dear friend, let the junk food go out the door and start eating something that was healthy for you. I was reading over here in the book of Proverbs. Let me read you a, a verse over in Proverbs chapter number 4. And uh, uh, you see if it's not so. Proverbs chapter number 4. Listen to this verse right here. <laughs> you talk about wonderful. Here's the real, here's the real essence of of enjoying life and of having life. Proverbs 4 says, My son, attend unto my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them. And help to their flesh. He goes on to talk about the heart. He goes on to talk about the mouth. He goes on to talk about the eyes looking right on the mouth not having perverse lips guarding the heart right of it are the issues of life. He said now stop and ponder the path of your feet. See if it's not so. The first thing I want to say is you ought to get a good dose of sound Bible preaching and then reading of the word of God. Amen. Amen. You want your soul to be healthy. You can't just go by these little junk stores and keep a healthy soul. That's right. God's people need the preaching of the Word of God. Yeah, One of the things that so thrills me about this congregation is the fact that over the years you've had preaching of the Word of God. And that preaching yeah, has affected your life and your heart and there's some health in this thing. Yeah, oh, listen. Get you a good dose of Bible preaching. And then studying of the Word of God. Implementing those truths into your heart. Asking the Holy Ghost to make them real unto you. We need that. I was thinking about not only that. But you know, if you really want, if you really want to get healthy, you can do that. Now you're not going to do it popping pills. You're not going to do it shooting this up or smoking that or doing the other. No, but you can take the Word of God and eat that good Bible food and God will bless you. But then you ought to get some good, fresh air sometime. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that you ought, to, you ought to get outside and smell the good blessings of the Lord. And every once in a while, venture back towards Calvary and get a good breath, a long breath of what Jesus has done for you. Yeah, yeah man. That fresh air will help you. Get in the sunshine, brother. Look up towards heaven. Feel the vigor of that class. Well, you get help. Strengthen your steps. Breathe freely. Breathing is correspondent to prayer. Talk to the Lord. Don't restrain from talking to God. Get in this thing and talk with Him. Oh, my friend. Then I thought about this. The Bible said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, there verse 7, 7 it said, it said, bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable unto all. Now, I use that verse to keep from going to the gym. <laughs> profiteth little. But there is profit in it. I mean, I guess. You know. But this idea of godliness. Exercise thyself unto godliness. Turn that energy that you have into something worthwhile to the glory of God. Do something for His benefit. Do something that would glorify Him. I mean, Visit a neighbor. Talk to somebody about the Word of God. Try to speak to them about their soul. Write a letter down there. Pray for somebody. Get to the house of God. Exercise thyself in confidence. Yeah. Well, that'll help you. Sure it will. Some of us have got to change some of the ways that we do. We're going to be healthy. Now, I know that we all have different tastes, okay? But now, I've noticed this over the years. 
Now, I'm, I'm not as good as some of y'all are. I, I promise you that. Some of y'all could live down at the beach. You know, I mean, that's what some folks are. They could just live there. And that may be a benefit. I'm not speaking against that. Personally, I'd rather have a river. You know. But some could live at the beach. But I have visited the beach. Excuse me. The coast. Yeah. A few times. <laughs> you're spiritual, you say coast. You know, if you're worldly, it's the beach. The coast beach. You know. <laughs> but uh, I've noticed this. In visiting the beach, how much more refreshed I was in being around there. Because in seeing that vast supply of water, I'm reminded of the sufficiency of God. I come to the mountains, I'm reminded of the littleness of man. I see the sufficiency of God. Can I tell you how to get healthy? Get over there in your spiritual life, next to the ocean, where you can behold the sufficiency of God in all things. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brother, it'll do something for you in your soul. God helps people who practice the rules of the heavenly position. You don't have to be weak and anemic in the things of God. John, he says, Brethren, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. Mm -hmm. I know that doctors are necessary when you need them. Yeah. But there's a lot of things you can do at home. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to go off somewhere to get it done. Yep. This matter of the soul, you need to give attention to your soul. Yep. Be in health, brother, sister. Let's labor that we might be picked. Now I'd love to see some of us take hold of those reins and go on with the Lord. My prayer is that your soul may prosper. Yes. And you physically may prosper. Stay around a long time. If somebody here doesn't know the Lord, can I tell you, knowing the Lord is the most wonderful thing in all the world. Being saved is worthwhile. Then after being saved, living for God. Having God work in my life and live in my heart. Day by day, know that he's actively involved in all the affairs of my heart. And I'm in his. I'm doing the will of the Lord. I'm exposing myself to what God would have me to be exposed to. Now that's worthwhile. I want to encourage you, if you don't know the Lord, you can know the Lord. If you want to walk with God, you can walk with God. If you want to be in hell, you can be in hell. I pray for you this morning. Our fathers, we look to thee this morning. We are mindful, yea, so mindful, that we're just as close as we want to be. So many of us live at a distance where we ought to. We confess this morning, Lord, that we need you more than anything. We feel weak in our soul. I pray, our Lord, that you'll take it. Bring us and restore us to hell. May we mind the doctor. May we do what he says. May we be refreshed in the presence of Help us to draw nigh unto thee in these dark, desperate hours. Perhaps somebody here needs to pray around the altar. Sister's going to play just a verse while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.
perhaps you'd like to come. If you're here and lost, you'd like to be saved, we invite you to come. If you're here and need to do work with the Lord around the altar, you're welcome to come. We want to invite you to come. While sister plays, would you like to come? We certainly suspended about everything during this coronavirus. We sure don't want to respect to suspend our spiritual health. Our spiritual health.